There's been a lot of talk in the press recently about the effect of legacy code, particularly programs written in the COBOL language, on both businesses and government's response to the pandemic. To see why a more than 60-year-old programming language has suddenly become a topic of interest, we need to delve back into why COBOL was developed, uh, what it was meant to do, and why we're sort of in the situation we are now. To do so, let's first look at the history of COBOL. COBOL, which stands for the Common Business Oriented Language, was actually developed back in 1959 as part of a Department of Defense initiative to come up with a portable programming language. Now, by portable, we mean one that could be moved from machine to machine or that could uh, sort of stay with the operating system as the machine was advanced. This was in contrast to previous code, which was written mostly in assembly language, uh, a bunch of zeros and ones that were uh, very specific to the hardware and operating system that the program was running on. The nice thing about COBOL is that in addition to being transportable, it was also fairly readable. Um, the syntax for COBOL looks very similar to English, and even non-programmers can usually understand at least the gist of what's being accomplished in a program. Um, COBOL has also been updated periodically throughout the years. Uh, even though it was uh, created in 1959, it was standardized in 1968, and we've since had four different uh, revisions, major revisions, to the program, with the last one being in 2014. So, if we focus on the idea that COBOL is relatively easy to read and understand, and then it's transportable, um, we'll see that that's sort of why it stuck around as long as it has. Now, first of all, to illustrate why I say that COBOL is relatively easy to understand, here I've got a block of COBOL code uh, side by side with some current uh, Python code, which is a, a currently popular programming language. And if you look at the commands in the code over on the left, you'll see that most of the commands look like verbs in English. Moved, a fixed error to a screen line, perform a function, and so forth. Well, if you look over at Python, it's not as close to normal English. Um, secondly, COBOL has been uh, around for, like I said, 60 years. And as a result of that, we see that um, every time a major update comes out in hardware or operating systems, uh, COBOL is carried along for the ride. So starting with the 1401 data processing system uh, created by IBM back in 1959, we've seen implementations of COBOL in every major revision they've done since. VAX, DEC, and all the other mainframe manufacturers um, have followed suit. And finally, as we said before, uh, COBOL has been through several major revisions to add lots of features to bring it closer to sort of a, a leading edge, if you will, uh, processing language. Now, it's like taking an old car and putting new parts on it. There's only so much you can do. And, you know, we can't make COBOL as completely functional and capable of doing the same types of things that newer uh, programming languages that were developed from the ground up to do so. But we added object-oriented programming in, in COBOL 2002, and we added features such as dynamic tables and so forth in COBOL 2014. So in a very real sense, one could argue that COBOL is sort of a victim of its own success. Um, nowadays, you see that 95% of ATM swipes use COBOL code. Not in the machine itself, perhaps, but certainly in the back-end processing of the payment transaction. Uh, likewise, there's 220 billion lines of code in active productive use today. Um, a recent study by American Banker found that 92 of the top 100 banks around the world are still using mainframes. And, for example, amongst them, Bank of New York Mellon had 112,500 different COBOL programs running. Uh, which constituted amongst those programs around 343 million lines of code. Also, it was reported recently that the Department of Justice, Security, Social Security Administration, the Treasury Department, the Veterans Administration, Department of Homeland Security, all still use COBOL in one form or another. So the issue isn't so much that COBOL is sort of an old language. The issue is that when those old programs in that old language were developed, uh, software design and uh, application, if you will, wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is today. In our classes here at Lehigh, we actually teach uh, classes on systems analysis and design. And what we 
teach the students to do is basically start from requirement analysis. Figure out the needs of the business and then document those needs and grow it through both visualization and analysis into the program that you need. So you start from the ground up and you create sort of a documentation trail, not just why did I write the code this way, but what business purpose is it serving, and how does this particular sort of approach depend upon that business process. So when you're dealing with legacy code, you don't have all that groundwork. You don't have the documentation per se. As a matter of fact, back in the 80s when programming was first coming into vogue for businesses, a lot of times you would hear programming referred to as, uh, or programs referred to as spaghetti code because uh, it was very difficult to read them. Um, there was no documentation and you basically had to pull it apart a strand at a time to see exactly where everything led. So what we're seeing right now is that there's big surges in demand that were not anticipated when the systems that are running COBOL were created. Um, the unemployment systems in the states are seeing uh, orders of magnitude more demand uh, for processing of unemployment applications than they've ever seen in the past. Um, and to some extent, there's been some reports, you know, now remember that the IRS was not one of the reported government agencies using COBOL code. But also remember that when they get the addresses and the contact information for the stimulus checks that they're sending them out, they're getting their information from, amongst others, the Social Security Administration and so forth, who are using COBOL code. So how do we deal with this, right? Where do companies and government organizations that are using COBOL go from this point onward? Well, they really have sort of three choices. First choice would be to do nothing. One could argue that, you know, given that we've never seen such a large surge in demand. We've never seen a situation like the pandemic before. Uh, by the time they could go back, rewrite their code, and set it up to handle situations that involve much larger demands for their services, um, it would be sort of too late. And to the extent that uh, you know, we hopefully will not see such a, a pandemic again in our lifetime, it might not be worth it either to governments or to businesses, all of whom are strapped for cash and would find it very difficult because they're not only going to have to hire programmers to fix the code, they're going to have to hire programmers that are capable enough to understand the existing code in order to fix it. Now, along those lines, another approach possibly would be to go out and find programmers who are sophisticated enough to understand the existing code and who could add the functionality needed to go ahead and handle larger demands. The third approach, strategic approach, would be to actually replace the COBOL code with codes written in newer languages such as Python or C++ or something along those lines. Um, nobody knows what the answer is going to be. I suspect it'll be a mixture of all three. Some companies won't find it feasible to replace their code. Other companies will try to patch their existing COBOL code. And after this, uh, in the years to come, we'll probably see some large banks and uh, state governments uh, completely replacing their COBOL legacy code with newer, more functional code. I hope you found this video informative and that it's helped to explain the situation that banks and state governments in particular find themselves in. Um, all of us, individuals, educational institutions, all types of governments and all types of businesses are finding ourselves dealing with very unexpected situations. Uh, at this point, all we can really do is do our best and hope that uh, eventually everything will come out okay. Take care.